Okay, I was just having some technical difficulties, but things should be better now. I got logged out of Twitch. I forgot my password. Ah, oh, Safari. Okay. So, I should be live. Feel free, if you're already watching, say hi in the chat. This will be intended to be a Q&A stream, so I'll be answering any type of question, maybe. Or people are free to ask any type of question. I don't know if I'll be able to answer everything, but we'll see how it goes. So I'm just observing the top game here. Okay, white one. Let's do a puzzle. Let's wait for people to come. And uh, I'll try and boost my puzzle rating a little bit. I had a, I had a good streak until this one. But I made up the points now. What is my rating? My rating is 2517. I'm trying to zoom in there just to show proof. Hey, it's Tabby Cat Meows. Welcome to the chat. Uh, okay, so let's try and focus for a moment here. Oh, there's so many people trying to distract me. But I won't give in to temptation. Let's, uh, let's solve this. So knight takes e4 was the last move. Just creating a ton of chaos. Because now the bishops are staring at each other. There's three attackers on the knight. The first thing that comes to mind is just bishop takes e4. Because this bishop is hanging. And then if bishop takes e4, rook takes e4, we can defend the bishop and be up a piece. And this looks really easy then. Another move White would like to play is this, but it runs into this, 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 this. It's just a trade, and White's down a pawn in the end. It's got to be bishop takes e4. Because if d5, we just take on e7. Black's not counterattacking the queen. All right. Moment of truth. What? Um, don't allow. <laughs> uh, oh, we keep going. Ah, so rook takes e4 is probably the right move. I mean, we can consider this, but then there's this, and again, black's counterattacking, and that would be good for black. So let's take with the rook. Success. It's a miracle. Okay. So framing off, I can shrink this a little bit. Let me know if look, things look okay and sound okay. So shift this over a little bit. Okay. So hello to people. Hello, Lacooks. E rug one two. Um, I, I can't answer your first question. I'm sorry. Domination. This is leechess.org. Dreamfall lost three games today. Well, if you lost three games today, you hopefully gained three lessons, assuming you have the right approach to losing. Uh, Zyper is back. Well, welcome back, Zyper. I ain't obese. Good afternoon. It's actually evening here. It's 9.07 p.m. I am a GM, long time no see. Juan Dream. Domination, going for distractions. Whoa, we have an Ethiopian viewer whose name I can't pronounce. What time is it in Ethiopia? Like probably afternoon, right? Capablanca did not know any opening theory. Well, theory was just different back then. I'm sure he knew some theory, but probably doesn't know much modern theory. Could God make a door he can't open? He can make a door that I can't open. I'm terrible with doors and keys. It's a real struggle, but I really don't know. Torilnagan is back. 
24, oh, 24,000 bits. I was like 24 bits. That would be doable. <laughs> What's the next badge? You already have the bit leader. What more do you want? Is it pod tie if it only has one noodle? Um, no, it's gotta be multiple noodles. But I don't know the exact number, at least two probably. What are these questions? I was hoping to have like an instructive like discussion stream where I, I answer like opening questions. I get questions all the time from people like asking about openings or specific positions. So hopefully we get some, <laughs> some better questions. McSqueegee from Melbourne. Um, <laughs> more Pad Thai questions. If you're eating Pad Thai in Thailand, is it just Pad? Um, they call it Pad Thai here. But the problem is, Pad Thai is actually a little bit difficult to find. And a lot of like these like kind of street side restaurants are serving like seafood and rice. And at least so far, I've had to put in a little bit of effort to find Pad Thai, but not too much effort. We have a viewer from Greece. Hello, George. Natural science or social science? Probably both. But if I had to choose, probably natural science. And we have a sub. Clunderberg82. Thanks for subbing. Starbucks in Thailand. How do you know? There's so many Starbucks. Like you walk, like I, I walk like a block away, there's a Starbucks and I walk two blocks away, there's another Starbucks. There's a lot of McDonald's too, which I've avoided completely. But Starbucks, it's hard to avoid. Why are you 2100 at puzzles? <laughs> Not good at chess. Um, the puzzle rating is inflated, I will say. Like my puzzle rating is 25, 23. Um, which is a bit higher than my actual rating. But I know for other people, it's there's a much larger gap. Which is okay. It's just kind of a different... Uh, the puzzle rating is different than other ratings because you're not competing against people, just competing against yourself, basically. Okay, let me make a study. I finally see a, a chess question. <laughs> study, new study. Okay. What do I call this? Answering question from the Twitch chat. Just so people in the future know where the questions are coming from. It's com completely public, so people will have access. And the first question, let me just copy and paste this. Um, ah, but people can't see, so I'll make a comment. Uh, which Sicilian line do I like the most for black? Um, if you're asking, like, personally, I really like the Taimanov. It's been in my repertoire for... Gotta be since high school. It's 2010. It's been in my repertoire for, like, the last eight or nine years, uh, which goes E6. E6, first of all, isn't the most mainstream move. Um, I mean, if we had to rank the Sicilian variations in popularity, um, let me just make a list. Most popular Sicilian variations. Uh, number one would be Nidorf. Number two would probably be, be Dragon. Three would be Sveshnikov. Maybe people can use the opening reference to get a, a better, uh, more precise ordering. Um, 
And then four would probably be like Khan slash Taimanov, which starts with e6. And I started playing the Taimanov because at least at a level below 2000, a lot of players just aren't prepared for it. Um, this is essentially the starting position of Taimanov. If we want to move further after knight c3, I play queen c7. Um, now Lee Chess is calling it the Paulson variation. But as far as I know, this is like the, the start of Taimanov. I'm going to switch this to inline. Inline. And there's lots of ideas. Usually black is going for some setup involving a6, knight f6, and then deciding if the bishop comes to b4, or bishop comes to e7. In some cases, black can take and put the bishop on c5. And then very often black will play b5, bishop b7. So it's just a different way of developing. Um, but there's a lot of theory. And I think there's a, a good book. If anyone wants to learn this opening, there's a book by Delchev called The Safest Sicilian, which I don't like the title. So I wouldn't call this like just a safe opening. Um, I would say it's more dynamic, but it's a very good book, offers a lot of great preparation. Uh, I'd recommend it for, for players, probably like 1800 plus. Uh, what to do when you're upset after losing too many games? Um, just go in the corner and cry. And then, okay, <laughs> um, the serious answer, after losing so many games, probably first of all, take a break. Like I've seen people, especially when they play online, like they'll get in like a losing streak and then they'll just try to keep playing to gain rating back and then they keep losing and then it's just a, a terrible cycle. Um, so take a break, but then make an effort to like come back and, and try and examine why you're losing. Um, like. Try and identify what's going wrong in your games and how to improve. If you can take a lesson away from every loss, and every, every loss should make you stronger. It's important to acknowledge that losing is part of getting better. And I've probably lost more games than most people in the chats combined, maybe with the exception of some people. But you know, it, it, to become a good player, you have to lose a lot, but you need to lose kind of with the right mindset. <laughs> Tell us why the exchange Roy is so awesome. Um, is that a question? Or that's more of a command? Well, <laughs> new chapter. I mean, why it's so awesome. It's so awesome, because look at the people who've played it. Carlson. Oh, wait, Carlson was black. Wait, this is not a good score at the top level, at least out of these four games. Um, no, I mean, OK, so the exchange Roy is played because white goes for like this long-term positional play. Where, okay, usually white castles, let's say black plays some move. Uh, okay, there's a lot of like natural development moves. Let's say bishop d6. And then after here, takes, takes. Um, even though white conceded the bishop pair, white just has better structure, which can be used later on in the endgame. And to demonstrate one of white's strategies, it's useful to actually understand some endgame positions. Because one of white's strategies is just to trade off everything and get into a king pawn ending. Or even if you get like some king rook ending or some king minor piece ending, and the pawn, pawns basically stay like this, where black has this, this crippled majority, and then white has uh, the uncrippled four on three majority. Uh, the long-term winning plan for white is to make a pass pawn on the king side and then just win. Uh, so to demonstrate this, 
Uh, let me make a new chapter here. And we'll just get rid of the pieces. Um, it's often, or it's common that like the E pawn can be traded for the F pawn and you can get some position like this. Maybe white's king could be more centralized. Maybe white will do some stuff with the pawns. Essentially, uh, when, when you play the exchange Roy, you want to aim for some sort of end game. Like king pawn ending, like this is almost completely winning. I think it is completely winning if you know the right strategy. Oh, let me shift the board over a little bit. Is the framing okay? I could size it down. Um, I don't want to embarrass myself, but I will say, like, this is a position I should beat anyone in, including Stockfish, as white. So let me try. For those who don't know, like, if you have a, a position, like, in a study or an analysis board, and you want to play it out in Stockfish, uh, I'll go to the menu here, continue from here, play with machine, And let's uh, let's crush some fish. I'll be white. I don't think it's too hard. Like I just push pawns and and it's my move. Okay, so let's start with this. Activate the king. Ah, oh, this is actually, yeah. Murmur brings up a good point. This is similar to the Berlin too with black having the damage structure. Um, okay, so we'll, we're going to activate the king. And then very soon, play f4 and then g4, f5. If h5, we'll play h3, preparing g4. I'm inclined to play a4 here. Just shut black down. Maybe there's no reason. Let's play g4. Okay, now very soon I want to play f5. Could maybe throw in c5. Just blockade the pawns even more. Yeah, let's throw in c5. I'll play a3, b4. The problem for black is that pass pawn can't be created on the queen side. And now I can go for this. Okay, I have to be a little bit careful. Let's do this. Okay, now the goal is to run up with a pawn and then make a queen. Or actually, maybe not make a queen, but just use this pawn as an eventual decoy. And very soon I'll start running and win all the pawns. So yeah, white can keep waiting. And now, now we can calculate the pawn race, but white should just be very, very fast. It's always so satisfying to beat Stockfish. Even if it was <laughs> relatively easy, easily winning position. Um, it's not going to resign, though. And play this out until the death. I make two queens. I could make knight and bishop. I'm too late now. Watch Stockfish just like stall 
and not move when I have made in one. Okay, mate is about to come. Aha, okay. So that's why the the exchange roy is so awesome. If you get to some later end game, you can win in style against Stockfish. Um, okay. I got very far behind in the chat. Uh, I should maybe leave a link to the study in the chat in case people want to toy around. Let me go back. What was this Twitch chat? Yeah, if, if you ever come across a leech ass study and you want to make a clone, just click this and then click clone and then you'll have full access. Um, okay, let me answer some more questions. Oh man, I'm scrolling up here. I'll try and go in order. I think the, the time delay is only like 10 seconds, but I'm so far behind in the chat that I'm reading comments from uh, from several minutes ago. Um, how long till I become a GM? Probably forever. Favorite Netflix series? Series? I mean, I binge watched uh, Breaking Bad, but that was not an original Netflix series. But it's probably my favorite thing on Netflix. And it's bits. But I can't see, make this bigger. Thanks, Coward Pong, for the 100 bits. Uh, what's my second favorite opening for white? Assuming that uh, London is my favorite. Second favorite opening. Um, probably Grand Prix Attack against Sicilian. I did a video probably about two years ago now for the, the St. Louis Chess Club. And I covered a bunch of different lines. Um, oops. I need to clear the position. A uh, new position, okay. But yeah, the uh, the position arising after e4, c5, knight, c3. Um, I've started playing this when I was like 14 years old, 15 years old. I think I started because I saw some really nice game between Nigel Short and a player named Hossein, also Grandmaster. And... It was just some closed Sicilian where white like plays g3, bishop g2, just gets a very um, very solid setup. Um, but short won like a really nice positional battle where like the whole game was very, very well controlled. If anyone wants to see that game, I can maybe Google it real quick. Nigel Short, Hossein. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's this one. Here's a good trick with, uh, with Lee Chess. If we just copy the link, go back to Lee Chess, add a new chapter, paste the link, it should pop up, better pop up. It didn't pop up. Maybe I grabbed the wrong link. Okay, let's try again. Okay, this, this should be the right link. Yeah, this brings back such good memories. Every so often I'll revisit this game. Such a nice game. Um, now I will say there is a difference between Closed Sicilian and Grand Prix. And sometimes I go back and forth. I think I, I probably play a lot more Grand Prix on streams where White plays earlier F4 and then Knight F3 and the Bishop develops here. But if I had to... Um, classify this opening as a whole. I just call it knight c3 Sicilian. Um, to show one really nice moment in this game, one really um, weird looking move, 
that a lot of normal human beings would ne never even consider um, coming up in, in this position, white to move. I know the t notation is right there. So I think a lot of people would play like f4 or um, maybe h3, g4. But short play the move, which really shows like his deeper underlying understanding here, which is knight c1, which is a very weird looking move on the surface. But the point is to play knight d1, another weird looking move, and then to play c3 and just kick this knight away and not allow the knight to trade off. Uh, and then the problem emerges for black because the plan was to play knight e7 to c6. The knights can kind of get in the way of each other. And that's sort of what happened. b4, knight d1, c3. The knight was forced away and black had just less active play. And then later white expanded on the king side and then um, I think also traded off the bishops and eventually won. Okay, let's move on. More questions. How do you handle a, a position that black keeps trying to close up? I mean, sometimes a position just gets closed naturally and you have to deal with it. Um, I mean, closed positions are not the end of the world and they're part of chess. Um, I know some players prefer open positions, some players prefer closed positions. Positions get closed because, okay, the, the pawns can get interlocked. So if you prefer open positions, sometimes you want to choose some openings where there's some more, more trades in the center, at least earlier on. Um, but it's hard to answer that question without like, seeing a specific example. Which is one thing I, I would encourage people to do. Like if you have specific questions of like moments and games, uh, make an effort to save the games. And then if you save them for a stream like this and I can better answer questions. Okay, how to counter Sicilian opening? Oh, I just, I think I just answered that. Play knight c3. Like if you play knight c3 and just know the setup, I think it's really solid. Like bishop e3, queen d2, put the pawn on f4, very solid setup. And then if you want to find high level games, just look in the master's database. Uh, maybe play out the first few moves, like choose g3 here. And, um, yeah, look at some strong players. All right, I'm very far behind in the chat, so I'm going to scroll down. I'm still trying to answer questions from bef before Coward Pawn cheered the 100 bits, which is a while ago. Um, okay. Uh, let me go, I'll, I'll go with most recent question. I'll try and work my way back. Uh, do I play Danish, do I play gambits in over the board tournaments? Only sound gambits. When was the last gambit I played? Okay, let me try and answer this. Um, last gambit I played, chess DB. If people ever want to like stock my over the board games, go to ChessDB, you can download a PGN, or can, you can just use their, uh, their tool. Um, oh, this game. This game, I, I kind of played a gambit, my, but my opponent declined it. Um, I'm gonna pick one of these to bring into Lee Chess. Yeah, actually, none of these were gambits. What opening was this? Forgetting the opening. Ah, this game, my opponent played a gambit. He sacked on c4. Oh, people can't see. Um, and I just played b5 to defend. I'm trying to, like, think back to 
when I played a real gambit. But none of these were gambits, really. Okay, so let me show. I mean, this game was technically like some sacrifice. Um, <laughs> we we drew in fourteen moves because I was tired, and I, I was not in good physical shape to play chess. Um, where is my study? Okay. Uh, answering questions. Uh, the last gambit I played. Uh, so interestingly enough, the game was in the Grand Prix Sicilian. So for all the people asking about Grand Prix Sicilian, uh, maybe this will offer some inspiration. Because the line I played in this game was a line I had never played previously, like not even online previously. And it's a line I only discovered like a month or two ago, maybe two months ago. Um, it starts from kind of a traditional Grand Prix setup, bishop going to c4. I've shown this in some like online lecture. Uh, and now this is a moment where I play d4. I mean, it's uh, a somewhat exotic pawn sacrifice. And I will say it's pretty dangerous if black is an amateur player and just doesn't know any theory. Um, and my opponent just started taking a lot of time from this moment. And he was able to come up with the best line over the board, which is why I, I agreed to a draw so, uh, so early. Um, but there's a very nice demonstration for white between Grishuk and MVL, which I'll go ahead and uh, insert here, where MVL accepted the gambit, and Grishuk won in like 20-something moves. Um, we should note that white is just giving away this pawn. I mean, there's three attackers and only two defenders. But white gives away the pawn for initiative. So what happened in the MVL game is black took, and then white just develops. And for losing a pawn, white has activated the queen, has opened the d-file, allowing rook d1, also preparing f5, where if, if lines start opening up, there's, uh, there's lots of pressure. Already some x-ray vision against the f-pawn. And for the person asking earlier about like what to do when, when your opponent closes down the position, uh, you want to look for pawn breaks, especially if your pieces are in good squares, you want to look for pawn breaks to open up the position. So the go-to pawn break is, uh, is f5. And coming up uh, after knight e7, so I remember studying this uh, MVL game in preparation for the game that I played. Um, and Grishuk played rook ad1, but I think it turns out that f5 is just so much stronger because white's already threatening f6. And if black takes, white takes back. Actually, what's the line here? Oh yeah, white takes back, still threatening f6. And if black takes with either knight or bishop, there's g4. And white's just winning, like on the spot. I think the computer approves like f5. Um, yeah, I mean, plus 1.7 is just a decisive advantage. Um, so in my game, my opponent took with a pawn, which is the best move. And I eventually win it back. I play knight b5. And black doesn't really have a great way to defend the pawn. e5 is way too greedy. I think I could, I mean, I could just take and play knight g5. And now f7 is attacked three times, only defended by the king. So my opponent uh, gave back the pawn. Uh, I play bishop b3 first to not allow any d5 ideas. And then, then it was just a normal position. So not the most exciting uh, middle game emerging from, uh, from this sort of opening. Um, but it was still fun to play over the board. So this is something that if people want to kind of learn on their own, 
I would recommend studying the games that have been played in this line and then using Stockfish to explore the, the sharper variations too. Because sometimes Stockfish can find some, some novelties or just some newer ideas. Okay, let me try and look at some more questions. Can I show how to play the QGD? I feel like I've shown this in many previous videos because I, I play it as one of my main openings. Um, yeah, there's one video I can point you towards. It's called Black Winds Against D4. And I mean, we could just Google it. Black Winds Against D4. I give a lot of insight in how to play like QGD, and also, yeah, this video. So if people want, you can look at this. Um, let me copy the link, and I'll just make a new chapter playing against D4. I'll just make a comment here to the video. Ah, oh, but it shares a Google link. So there we go, okay. That's better. And Lee Chess actually, this is an amazing feature which I feel like more people should use. But if you're watching a YouTube video and you wanna do like your own analysis, you can just watch in the same window because uh, it embeds. I think it should resize. Yeah, it resizes, that's so nice. Um, and then you can play along and use Stockfish and see all the, the moves that I maybe uh, recommend incorrectly or correctly. Um, another resource which should still be on Lee Chess. Let's go back to study. If you go to Lee Chess studies and you type in how to play against 1d4 um, I think it's this one. Yeah, it's this one where I give a lot of like Queen's Gambit declined preparation with um, with annotations. Uh, people can't see the chapters tab. Ah, but now people can. Maybe I'll let me reframe things a little bit. Should have done this before I started. All right, is that better? That should be better, right? Now people can actually see the, like, the whole interface. Center stuff, shrink my head a little bit. I think that's better. Uh, I just wanted to show like the chapter tab and show I, I do give like Queen's Gambit declined uh, recommendations because um, when you play Queen's Gambit Decline there's a few different variations like exchange variation when white takes immediately and you get some kind of classic structure um, and then there's some other lines where like white takes immediately and then goes for this Queen F3 move and then I give recommendation against London too which is one of my favorite openings to play is black. So, okay, so I'll leave a link to this study in the other study. Um, just make a new comment here. It should be below the video. Study on how to play against 1d4. Okay. Okay, more questions. Oh, how to play against closed Sicilian. But you want me to answer this quickly. Okay, I'll give you one very quick recommendation. How to play against closed Sicilian. I'm gonna try and keep this response like below a minute. Just very simple recommendation. So let's say you're a Sicilian player and you're encountering Knight C3. My recommendation is 2a6. 
which looks weird. But the idea is to discourage the bishop from developing. So you avoid any like dangerous grand prix attack line. And um, if white allows you, like let's say white plays g3, then you play b5. And you just gain space immediately. White plays bishop g2, play bishop b7. And then very often you go for, uh, for e6 and d5. Like if d3, e6, f4, d5. And um, I enjoy this for black. If white takes, you can play knight f6, then recapture with the knight because the pawn is pinned. And otherwise, if white plays e5, then you can play h5, and then knight h6, knight f5. And then white can't really get in g4, and it's actually a very nice position. Your bishop goes to e7, knight goes to c6, queen goes to b6. You can expand further. And I've played this, this sort of structure many times in online games and like some over the board games with, uh, with very good success. Curious if I have any games in the Lee Chess database. Mm, maybe I have a game with knight h6. Uh, I probably do, just these people are too high rated. So, um, and this is one thing, like with any sort of opening, sometimes the most difficult part is like getting a good recommendation. But then once you have the recommendation, uh, then you can start exploring on your own and use a database and kind of build your repertoire from there. Uh, what tea am I drinking? That's a great question. Um, if anyone can guess the, treat, the tea that I'm drinking, I'll answer whatever, they, whatever question they want, but you have to guess correctly. And if no one guesses correctly, maybe I'll just end the stream. <laughs> Lee Chess is so awesome. Yeah, I mean, the, the interface here is incredible. Um, it's just more awesome that everything is free, too. Okay, this isn't a question, but I'll just add as a, as a chapter because I feel like people should know. How does Lee Chess make money? <laughs> um, and maybe more importantly, how to donate to Lee Chess. Um, Lee Chess runs completely on donations and like I'm only like sharing this not because they, they pay me or anything just because I feel like people should know but if you want to like donate to Lee Chess or buy their swag it's hard to find on the site like you have to you have to dig because it's not like in any of the top menu bars you have to scroll all the way down and you have to scroll even further down than my my window shows. Where is it? Ah. I'm trying to zoom in. Oh yeah, here we go. So you can like, they have a patron program or the swag store. So it's useful um, if you wanna keep WeChess running. <laughs> Oh, uh, what happened? Oh, this is another study. Okay. Oh, I forgot to look at the T, the T guesses. Oh, this chat. Okay, yeah, no one's getting it correctly. I'm drinking very obscure tea. Bubble tea, Earl Grey, green, jasmine, chamomile, peppermint, no one's right, oolong, no. Starbucks is the closest answer. Give some hint. The hint, it, it's like one of these weird Tivana brands that most people probably have never heard of before. <laughs> And I've never actually seen it in the US. I've only seen it, I think, in Indonesia and now Thailand. I'm going to control F in case I missed it. No. Um, the, the tea that I'm drinking, it's called Emperor Cloud and Mist, or Clouds and Mist. It's really good. 
like it's not one of like these strong like overpowering I don't even know is it green or black people want to google this yeah I was not lying the problem though I ordered a venti and they put they put two tea bags in the tea so it was actually a little bit strong like two tea bags they big tea bags too but it's very good and it's like what a dollar fifty and it's um just so calming okay oh, these questions I'm not taking challenges. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait. I saw a question, but now I lost it. Oh, e4, e5, knight f3, d5. Uh, asked by Chesskudo. This is called the elephant gambit, right? How to play against elephant gambit. Pretty sure this is Elephant Gambit. Yeah, Elephant Gambit. Honestly, I don't think I've ever seriously studied this. Or if I have, I just forgot. But I think what I can do, I can maybe show how I would go about studying this. Um, first of all, let's go to Masters Database. Let's see what good players play. Okay, E takes D5. If it's the most played move in highest scoring, I usually stick with it. Um, I know the main point for Black is to play E4 and grab some initiative. And again, Queen E2, very high scoring. And this is a very good sign if like all the top players are winning is white then we probably want to follow them. So if I was building a repertoire, I'd probably include like knight f6, but also queen e7. And just go through like the main lines. We'll start with knight f6. Okay, so d3, logical. But knight c3, even higher scoring. So sometimes when there's like a couple options, I'll just get some inspiration from the games, open some games in new tab, and let's see. So, oh, this is Mosesian. Is this a Blitz game? Why would MVL play the Elephant Gambit? Oh yeah, this is the World Blitz Championship in 2010. So a while ago. Okay, so knight c3 takes, white's just up a pawn. Queen d1 is actually logical. Sometimes gambits like this, you just want to grab a pawn and be happy, complete development. I think black got some initiative, but not, uh, not too much. So that was knight c3. Oops. Um, I would also use stockfish here, just give some initial impression, and we'll have it give like three lines. I might jump around a little bit. Okay, d3 and knight c3 are pretty close. Let's look at one more game. Okay, so this is a game with d3. Seems like black just equalized, <laughs> like no problem. Yeah, let's go back. Let's go back to the opening book. Um, Back to Stockfish. 
And we'll just stay with the stockfish move and see how this unfolds. So queen takes d5. And yeah, that game with knight c3 just doesn't seem right. Or no, it was d takes e4 it didn't seem right. Um, ooh, knight g5. What is knight g5? Sometimes if, if the top stockfish move is like a very rare move, then I'll look into it a bit deeper. But now I'm also seeing like knight d2 is quite playable as well. Let's stick with knight d2. Knight c6, d takes e4, queen h5, queen b5 looks nice. In queen b5 it's a type of move, maybe it's harder to figure out just over the board. But, um, I mean, if white can trade queens and just hold on to the pawn, then it's nice. Bishop c5. Like knight b3. Just go for some trade. Uh, but knight b3 gives back the pawn. But maybe it's still comfortable. There's also e5 here, which might objectively be better. Wait, e5? Almost wins a piece. Black has to move the knight to defend the bishop. Mmm, e6, nice move. F takes e6. So white gave back a pawn, but now black is left with a very ugly pawn on e6. I like this move, knight e4. Which is a novelty. Maybe add a small annotation here. Novelty. Where white just has nice development, some attack on the bishop. And that we should note the bishop is pinned. So white is pretty much guaranteed to get the bishop pair. Looks like a6 is the move. a6. Queen c4. Now attacking e6. Looks like white's maintaining some edge. There's better structure, some initiative. So I could expand on this further. Like I could spend an hour of just looking at this opening. Um, and it's sometimes a type of opening you're going to run into very rarely. So you just want something simple. Um, hey, it's bits with a question. I'll, I'll get to that question in a moment. But um, yeah, you want to get to the point where you just, you can remember this even if you encounter this like months from now. So, okay, so we allow e4, we play queen e2, we attack, we win back the pawn, and then queen b5 is probably what I would try to, to commit to memory. Then e5, e6 is just icing on the cake. Okay. Um, yeah, hopefully that gives a starting point at least. Uh, what's the difference between the polar bear and the bird's opening? Also, thank you, Naked Yeti 99, for the bits. Um, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this, because I was asking my asking this to myself like a little while ago. Difference between the bird and polar bear. I mean, as far as I know. They start off the same way. I mean, the bird is just f4 on move one, bird opening. But then, I mean, the ultimate goal will be to make Leech S a polar bear. So let's say d5, and then b3, like knight f6. Pretty sure, like, this is the polar bear is when you put your bishop on the diagonal and then go for control over e5. So I think this is polar bear. <laughs> I almost typed polgar bear. Um, yeah, polar bear. Maybe someone can correct me, but I don't know. 
Hey, Kiyomi in the chat. Welcome back, Kiyomi. Um, but yeah, the idea is to get just some simple setup, sometimes even bishop d3, and you go for like some kingside attack. I think King Crusher plays this a decent amount. But yeah, I don't think I can add too much more. It can also be like a ver reverse Dutch, like depending how play unfolds. Uh, I'm scrolling up here because I feel like I missed a lot. But okay, let me try. Let me try and answer some easy questions. Uh, what's your favorite e4, e5 opening as white? Against weaker players, probably Ponziani. Against stronger players, I have three favorites. So, okay. Favorite e4, e5 openings. Openings for white. Okay, favorite number one. I'll just show the openings without going too deeply. Ponziani. Great opening to teach beginners, very simple. White wants to play d4 and dominate the center. Um, opening number two, which I like to play a lot in Blitz, is four knights with a3. Because there's lots of tricks. Just to show some tricks, just for inspiration. First trick. I, what, what do we call this? Oh, the Gunsberg variation. Um, yeah, trick number one, if black plays bishop c5, center fork trick. This is already better for white. Bishop c5 is dubious. Uh, trick number two, if black plays like a6 or bishop e7, uh, white will play d4. And you basically get a four knight scotch where black can't access b4 for the bishop. And then one more trick, if black plays d5, which is objectively the best move, then white can take, black takes back, and then very um, interesting move here, knight takes e5, which if black hasn't seen before, I've played this a good number of times in blitz, um, including against uh, Andrew Tang in some bullet game where um, it confused him a little bit and then like I just won a pawn early. Um, the point being if knight takes, there's queen e2. And then a lot of players will take on c3 and then white just wins a pawn, takes, and then you win this and just better end game. But if I'm playing it like a, in a high level tournament and um, I want something more reliable, um, and something with just a better reputation, I would usually play Spanish. And Spanish can branch out into so many different things. But um, yeah, against weaker players and against um, like against people in Blitz, I'll play either Ponziani or this Four Knights with A3. Have I already made a study how to play against the French? I don't think I made a complete study. Still working on that. What do I recommend for e4 for an 1100 player? Um, I usually recommend either just king's pawn, e4, e5, or Sicilian. Maybe I can give one quick recommendation in Sicilian. Recommendation for c4 for 1100 rated player. Very simple variation. Um, I think we would call this a four knight Sicilian. You can start with e6. And this is mainly for open Sicilian. Play knight f6 attack in the pawn. I like to recommend this because there's a few traps. First trap, if white plays e5, there's queen a5 check. Second trap, if knight c3. Um, Actually, we'll get to the trap later, but um, black can play knight c6, and now we have a four knights. And the trap is more uh, more positional, where 
a lot of players will just try and develop normally, like play bishop to e3, natural looking move. And then black can play bishop b4. And then it's a very easy position to play for black because d5 is coming, the center is breaking down. If white plays like bishop d3, still d5. And very often black wants to play e5 and just expand in the center. So I think this is a relatively simple, uh, simple line to play if you're just starting out. Okay, this is tiring. I don't think there's any caffeine in this tea either, which makes it more tiring. <laughs> oh man, okay, where are the questions? Oh, can I play against spectators? Maybe I'll play later. But I did like I did plan this Q and A in advance. And sometimes when people ask me questions, I just tell them to ask them during Q and A. So I'm trying my best. Could I go over Nimzo Larson? What is Nimzo Larson? Is that B three? I will say I know very little about. Nims of Larson. Hey, it's You Got Jess. Usually the bits come with a question. You Got Jess, just giving me bits for free. Thanks, You Got Jess. Whoa, more bits. Serenilio with 500 bits. Well, if you guys have questions, let me know. Ah, Kiyomi asking, could I go over how to create imbalances? Maybe in a position like exchange French. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, let me make a new chapter. Creating imbalances in exchange French, which is one of the most boring openings ever. Yeah, so an imbalance in chess is just like a difference between both sides. And it can come in many different forms in terms of, okay, material imbalances, pawn structure, space, minor pieces like knight versus bishop, um, sometimes like king safety. These are all types of like advantages or differences to be aware of. Um, in this sort of position, it's very symmetrical. There's really no imbalances apart from the fact that white has uh, the extra tempo. Um, what would I like to show? Like, let's say we're playing black and we're trying to be the higher rated player. And let's say white just goes for some normal development scheme, like something like this, uh, not f3, bishop d3 and castling. Um, one way to go for some imbalance is to just castle queenside like make it a sharp game and black has a lot of flexibility in terms of the setup so if you're a french player and you want to play something aggressively from this position i can recommend starting with bishop d6 and then putting the knight on e7 uh, this way if white ever plays bishop g5 you can respond with f6 Let's say the bishop moves back, then you play knight c6. Let's say white castles and bishop g4. And the plan very soon is queen d7 and castling. And um, yeah, any student who plays the French, I recommend them to you know, learn the setup. Because it can be very fun to play going forward in the middle game, where it's going to be a sharp position. Like, let's say white completes development, get some position like this. I think the attack is actually easier for black because g5 can come with tempo and then h5, h4 could attack the bishop and maybe further down the road open some, uh, some files. But again, it depends. Like sometimes, uh, sometimes 
based on the specific position, there's, there's different ways to create imbalances. Um, I think the, the best resource to like fully answer this question is a book, uh, Reassess Your Chess by Jeremy Silman, where it's just completely dedicated to like all the different types of imbalances in chess and how stronger players can essentially outplay weaker players from different types of positions. What should you look after if someone plays a Kashrin Gambit and you're playing black? Pretty sure there's there's a very key move that if you're a Petrov player and you run into the Kashrin Gambit, there's essentially one move to know. Pretty sure the move is d5, but I'm not sure when. So let's investigate. Yeah, if you play the Petrov, you should know what the Kashrin Gambit is. Unless you play the Stafford Gambit. If you play Knight c6, you don't have to worry about the, the Kashrin Gambit. Um, but Kashrin comes after d6, and then Knight takes f7. And White Gambit's a, a Knight. And it's kind of similar style to Halloween Gambit. It's not sacking a pawn, it's sacking a whole piece to take over the center, get some initiative. Um, so... Pretty sure white plays d4 here. Yeah, d4. There's some trap. Like you do not take on e4 because queen h5 and then queen d5 and you lose a piece back with a bad position. Um, oh, maybe it's c5. Maybe this is a move. Yeah. And like this is something I honestly don't really know much about, but it's usually pretty straightforward to figure out with the master's database. Uh, c5, d takes c5. Ah, now here d5? Maybe we can verify with stockfish too. d5 scores amazingly for black. If it's stockfish approved, play d5. Odds are white will be not so well prepared as this is a pretty offbeat line. You probably have to know further, like e5. Why is oh, it's being weird. Um, so knight g4 or queen e8 are both playable. This looks nice. This pawn is weak. Curious if bishop f4. Ah, so we're attacking this pawn. We also want to take this pawn and target f2. So black is essentially getting initiative and is up a piece. If you can take on c5, play rook f8 and castle. Life is so good. <laughs> up a piece and some attack. So, okay, hopefully that answers the question a little bit. But again, I would encourage you to, to dig deeper. Um... Like you, the, the combination of stockfish and opening reference uh, can be a good solution if you don't have like an opening book or video to kind of fall back on. Uh, were there bits? There were bits. A tuna. Was there a question? I don't know. Ah, there was a question. Oh, you got just asked if I can discuss pawn play, when to push, and the fine line of overextending. I should have a study for this. It really comes down to like specific examples. I could maybe give some example. Um, yeah, let me give like one example, or a couple examples, emerging from Sicilian pawn play. When to, when, when, and when not to. Wait, I can't do grammar. When to push, okay. <laughs> um, let's imagine we're playing black. Or we're playing white. Okay, let's say we're playing white. And it's some opening. 
First of all, let's say black plays knight f6 here. And this will be interesting. Let me give the, the Twitch chat some, some exercises. So people, you have to stop asking questions just for a moment. And um, now I'm going to ask some questions. First question, should white push e5? Good move or bad move? Is it overextending, like weakening white, or is it justified? OK, people saying bad. Always push. Wait, did I specify? Good move theory, bad move. Yeah, always listen to Yasser, push him, baby. I'm actually surprised how many people are saying bad move. Um, in this case, e5 is very much justified. This is a great move. This is the best move. The most tremendous move. Um, essentially, what white is doing here is gaining time on the knight. And... The reason why this isn't really weakening for white or, or overextending, I mean, the pawn is well supported by the knight, and black won't have any attackers, and like this knight doesn't have a great square to move to. If the knight moves to d5, then white can play knight c3, attacking the knight again. If black takes, white takes back. Such a great position for white. Ahead in development, this pawn can have more support, the bishops develop fluidly. Uh, white could castle. I'm pretty sure there is a game, actually, there is a game after black played e6. I think it was Nakamura's quickest loss ever. Like, he lost in 12 moves. Let me find it. Yeah, this one. Insert. Such a short game. Um, make main line. If, if anyone wants to see Nakamura lose in 12 moves, this is a spectacular game. Um, just to show it real quick, like Naka just got crushed in this game. Like everything went wrong for black. Queenside castle and then rookie one, he just resigned. Like white just developed immediately and black just could not develop. Like there's threats of this, this king is stuck. This is back before the Pro Chess League. This is a US Chess League. I did give a lecture on this game, actually. If you type into YouTube, like Nakamura loses in 12 moves, you should probably find it. Um, uh, let's do it real quick. Nakamura loses in 12 moves. Eric Rosen. Yeah, this one. Okay. Where'd it go? Oh my gosh, I have too many tabs open. So overwhelming. There we go, okay. Just leave this as a comment. Um, but I wanna give some more, more examples. Uh, one more example of pawn play. Um, let's say black plays like Knight c6. Now e6, or now um, bishop c4, e6. Um, knight c3. Let's say a6, preparing b5. a4. And now, let's say knight f6. Okay, I think this is a good example. Um, yeah, white to move, question is, e5, good move or bad move? This is similar to the previous example, where again, we're just moving forward to attack the knight. Uh, should white play it? Should white do something else? Let's hear what, uh, what people have to say.
we have we have yeast we have this looks good in my eyes we have now that's bad good most definitely yes this is nice some people will will learn some valuable lessons bad move bad move bad move good move i think terrible move <laughs> quite good but not winning all right let me let me give some answer here this is actually just a bad move um e5 i think this kind of goes back to like the definition of a weakness really important to understand what what a weakness is in chess because in this case e5 is is like bound to be a weakness because it's very easy for black to attack and it's harder for white to defend. Now, the move to play here for black and the move which punishes e5 is knight g4. And then the problem emerges for white that like white is just going to, going to run out of defenders. Like the knight is already defending, but there's two attackers. Only decent looking way to defend the pawn is queen e2. And then queen c7. Three attackers. Bye bye your pawn. So whenever you overextend, sometimes you have to like see the potential attackers and potential defenders. Uh, in the other case, black didn't have this immediate uh, exploitation over the, the e5 pawn. Actually, just to go back to show in the other case, if knight of six and then knight g4, there would be the immediate h3, just kicking the knight because the pawn's defended. But in this case, um, after knight g4, white can't play h3 because black already has a threat, and black is the one seizing initiative. So sometimes when you play a move like this, you want to make sure that you can keep initiative and that you're not uh, creating an unnecessary weakness. Uh, baby onion, I think I answered your question. Um, yeah. And there's so many more examples of pushing pawns. Um, if you like these types of examples and you want to learn more about pawn play, I can recommend a book. And it's a book I actually haven't read, but I've just heard great things about. Um, just type into Google Sam Shanklin to Pawns, and it's this book, I think. Yeah, it has some clever title. I'm sure it's on Amazon, too. And Sam Shanklin even has some lectures on um, on the St. Louis Chess Club YouTube channel. And they're like hour-long lectures talking about like different concepts from his book. So maybe I can link some of those too. Uh, Sam Shanklin, Louis Chess Club, or no, um, it's Sam Shanklin's Secret Life of Pawns, I think. Yeah. And then you get all the videos. So Google, yeah. Okay, let's make a new chapter. Okay. Do you think training blindfold tactics for visualization is important? How do you train blindfold tactics? I guess you would need someone to like tell you where the pieces are. Because it's not like playing blindfold chess where you start from the initial position. Um, yeah, I would say it's probably not the best way. Like if you're looking to train visualization, I would say just play blindfold games. And you can do that in Lee Chess. 
Uh, Picasso94, thanks for subbing. Uh, just to show, like, if you want to... If you want to train your visualization and your blindfold skills, you can go preferences. Um, blindfold chess. Oh, people can't see. Ah, now people can see. You just turn it on and then it saves. And then I think if you start a game, yeah, if you start a game now, now it's mindful chess, and then you can work on your visualization skills. So I think because I started a game, <laughs> and this guy is here, um, I'll play him. Only 12, okay, it is a rated game. But I'll play him, and I'll try and answer more questions while playing blindfold. Let's see how this goes. Um, okay, let's play uh, Petrov. Can you hold the position Magnus posted on Twitter? I did not see what Magnus posted on Twitter. Oh, this, um, the 10-year challenge. I don't think I could on a normal day. If I was really sharp and focused, maybe I could. But it would be difficult. In a tournament, maybe I could figure it out, but... I feel like it is a difficult position to hold. Okay, so I'm playing the Stafford Gambit. Um, if people want to see the pieces, you can just go to watch my games. I guess I could leave a link in the chat. Um, still in, in preparation. And now I'll scroll up and just prevent or, and um, look at questions that I can answer without any analysis board. This guy, he's, I think he's giving me a pawn. This looks like a free pawn. What's the best defense against French? More like what's the best attack against the French? It's bishop g5. In bishop g5, we could trade a bunch. Maybe I'll play h6. Let's play h6. Um, yeah, my, my recommendation against the French, I can give a few recommendations. I mean, the one that I recommend the most is the two knights attack. I think it's suitable for any player below master level. Bishop h4. Looking for some way to be aggressive here. Could play g5. Let's play g5. Being very aggressive. I can also recommend the wing gambit against the French. It's an interesting line. So I'm just developing. I have my bishops in the center. Ooh, bishop takes c7. So he's trying to deflect my queen from defending d4. The problem is that I have this move, check. And then I'll win the bishop and just be up a piece. I won the pawn back too. I guess he won c7. Trying to visualize where all the pawns are. Plays queen f3 attacking the knight. Um, I could put the queen on e5. Queen on e5. Okay, so the bishop develops. It's castle queenside. Okay, now it's time to go for some attack, h5. The later this game goes, the more I have to just stay focused. So I don't want to forget where the pieces are. But I have some nice attack. Play 
G4. Probably my rook wants to come in. I have this and this. Okay, so I'm trying to <laughs> remember where all of White's pawns are. You know, I think it's just like this. And my pawns are like, what? Plays f3. So he wants to play f4. Oh, he's defending the pawn too, which I forgot to take. So let's play the rook to g8. Oh, I couldn't take it because he has a queen and the bishop. So now he plays f4. So now I can't on passant. Queen c5 check. Also c3 I think is hanging. Let me start with queen c5. Okay, so the... The king goes to h1, and now I'll play h4. I'm trying to figure out a way to break through. So I have the pawns and the rooks and the queen. He plays e5, so my knight should probably move. Ah, there's a nice mating idea. Play this. Threatening some very nice, like, maiden 3, I think. Don't see it, please. Even if he does see it, it might be hard to... <laughs> Just Neptune says, the stream is laggy, we can't see any of the pieces. Because I'm playing blindfold chess. I know there's a way to have like the board show up somewhere so people can see it, but I still wouldn't be able to see it. But if you want to see the board, just... Okay, I'll share the link in the chat again for those who just joined. Um, queen f2. Queen f2 is kind of annoying. Because I'm not mating. We could just trade. Because I don't want to lose the a7 pawn. Yeah, we'll trade. And I'll probably go for g3. Because now I'm attacking the rook and some file will open up. If he takes on g3, I probably take with knight. Rook f1. So I have pawns here and here. He has pawns here and here. But I have my rooks, and his king is here. This looks fun. G takes h3. So this is a fork. I just win the rook. I'll take with check. So everything is falling apart for white. My knight will take f4 next. Sometimes these end games you really have to keep track of where the pawns are. But I think I'm just simplifying. Let's see, takes d3, okay. Let's move the rook in. So he has king, pawn, 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 rook. I have rook, rook, bishop, plays rook f1, so this pawn's attacked. Let's move the bishop back. I think there's still a pawn on h2, if I'm not mistaken, which I'm about to win. D4. 
Where's the king? Oh, the king's on e3. So maybe there's some mating idea. Like king f4, rook g4 is mate. Pretty sure. Yay, I win. Okay. It takes work to like just stay focused. Um, but it's, it's a training exercise I can recommend for people who want to try and practice like remembering where everything is. Um, just to show the game. My opponent was very generous to me, giving me some, uh, some free gifts in the opening, mainly the d4 pawn. I am thinking of like making a new Lee Chess account just dedicated to blindfold chess. So I think it would be interesting like what my ratings would be, especially like Blitz and Bullet would be much lower than normal. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I hope uh, you got Jess appreciates my, my pawn play in this game. Um, yeah, for those who weren't observing and couldn't keep track, these pawns advance pretty far. I, I pushed them because they were supported. Like by both rooks, and because white's king is here. So even if I like lose one of them, like files open up. Sometimes that's one of the main reasons you push pawns, is just to open files. So what I really wanted, let me turn off the engine. Arrows, yeah. Um, in this position, queen f2 is a good kind of defensive move. So if white plays any other like normal looking move, uh, there's knight g3, which is a nice like puzzle puzzle rush type problem. It takes takes, and then I would mate. So the queen controls g1. But queen f2, okay. Yeah, this is important because if I wasn't paying attention, and I play this, and there's this, and white has counterplay. So yeah, this is a fun position. I don't know what white should play here. I mean, it's it's pretty difficult. Like bishop d5 is coming too. Um, oh, knight g3 after queen f2. I considered this, but... Ah, I forgot that. Wait, what did I forget? Or no, I, I don't think I forgot anything. I was thinking if takes, then okay, black wins the queen here, but white can just play king g1. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if there's any, like, great follow-up. Like, I don't think I can even win the rook. Because if takes, and rook takes. Otherwise, I have to move the queen, but then I lose a knight. Okay, so that was fun. Axe Villager back in the chat. Welcome back, Axe Villager. Click on your profile name. Pieces blindfold. I think my, uh, if I make a new account, actually I don't want to say what the name would be because then someone might copy it before I create it. <laughs> I'll keep it secret. Maybe I'll, I'll just keep it secret and then like eventually people will find out. Um, any tips for being quicker with coordinates? Yes, this is going to be fun to answer. So whenever I teach uh, like these after school like chess classes where there's like bunch of kids and they're hard to control, um, I like to teach And sometimes you, you don't have access to one, but I like to teach in, in like one of these rooms with like the smart board with the touch screen. And usually what I do is have them practice coordinates and I'll load up Lee Chess and I'll show them this game with the touch screen. So they have to like run around and touch the coordinates on like the big projector. Um, essentially, uh, you have to click the coordinates without having access to the pieces, uh, or the, the letters and numbers, I should say. So, like if you get good, you can do it 
relatively quickly. This is also good for testing mouse speed. Pretty sure Andrew Tang is like ridiculous at this game. I'm so slow. F7, D8, F4, E7, 17. And you could flip, you can do it from black side too. Okay, let me try and be competitive here. I'll try and break 30. I think 30 is reasonable. Okay, G7, E1, E6, E5. Feel like there's people that like break 50, maybe even break 60. I was watching uh, another streamer, uh, Peshka, who's like one of the, I think he's top in the world for eight year olds. And he was doing this uh, the other day and he broke like, I know he broke 50. It was pretty ridiculous, like watching him just so fast. Did he get 70? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I, th yeah, I mean, 39. Maybe it seems impressive, but yeah, there's players who can do it much faster. <laughs> Baby Onion, can I challenge you where you play against my Italian? Uh, yes. <laughs> Did Baby Onion challenge me? Or he was asking permission. Hmm. Thanks for my tips against French. Did I give tips against French? Oh, I wanted to show the wing gambit against the French. Where did my study go? Ah. Just closing tabs here. I think I lost the study. Um, also, yeah, thanks for the bits. I don't know what your name is, but thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have, we have the study wing gambit against French. Um, just to show, I won't go too deeply but if you want to play some crazy line against French, you can play b4 in this position. And c takes b4, a3. And the idea is that you trade off black's bishop, and black takes, and you take. It's very hard to stop knight b5, knight d6. You have a6, you still go knight b5. Um, so it's an interesting line. If black doesn't take and plays like this, and you do this, 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 and you get this nice kind of structure where black doesn't have c5 and you, your pawns are just so good and there's compensation. So it's similar to some Banco style gambit. Oh, you have a problem keeping your lead in pieces. That's one of the problems with being up material. When you have more pieces than your opponent, there's more things to potentially lose. So you have to be careful. Um, I mean, one strategy is just to continually look for your opponent's threats. And before you make any move, like you'll look at your opponent's ideas and their, what they're attacking. Um, this is what we call blunder checking, where you're just looking for, uh, for landmines ensuring that things are are well controlled uh so baby onion your name is gch82 okay i'll play you and i'll i'll go into your italian ah, i'm black wait i want my <laughs> i want to see the board i want to be or i want to make this a bit more viewer friendly let's go back 
and no blindfold refresh okay so we're playing against baby onions italian do i have any theory against the grab after this game i'll try and show it so baby onion just told me to play this and uh, now i think i'll be free to do what i want And this is just very standard stuff so far. Um, and we're, okay, we're going to have a very symmetrical position. Takes me back to childhood. So this is maybe the first moment where I have a couple options. Like castling is most normal, but then white can strike first with like bishop g5 and knight d5. Uh, so there's a couple ideas here for black. One idea is to play knight a5 and just get the bishop pair. The other idea is to play bishop g4 and knight d4. Oh, you were hoping for two knights. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to play you in another game. Uh, I want to do this. I want to be aggressive. Knight d4 coming. Also, thanks for the bits. The wood layer numbers disguised as letters those bits are going to buy some pot tie later so all these questions it's working up i'm working up an appetite yeah so h3 i mean it's a move but it doesn't really solve much i guess white could maybe go for this if white plays g4 i'll consider taking it might be a good uh, good sacrifice. G4 takes, takes, takes. And then this is a monster threat. If you love Pod Thai, you should, you should subscribe and then you get the Pod Thai emote. <laughs> Pod Thai is great. Um, Bishop E3, that's a decent move. Because now if I play knight d4, just takes it. So I think I'll just play knight d4 anyway, and then just look to get the bishop here. I show queen's gamut, except it is white. I mean, there's some very basic traps. Um, if I remember, I can try to show something. I also have to remember to show the grab. Okay, so grab and queen's gambit. We'll see how long this stays in my memory. <laughs> uh, A4. I'm going to play A6. A4 is a little bit weird. The idea of a6, I want to make sure this bishop stays on the board for a while. It's always very nice when, especially a position like this, might trade it off the dark squared bishop. I'm keeping my own dark squared bishop. I'm very tempted to go for like g5, g4. This is another concept uh, Sam Shanklin talks about in his book, the concept of a hook. Because white's committed to h3, g4 will like, guarantee the, the g-file to open up. Okay, I can't resist. There's an elephant trap. Good. I mean, it's good if the opponent walks into it. And even if they don't walk into it, it's still uh, very playable. Okay, now do I go completely insane? So conflicting. Let's do it. YOLO. This is probably a dubious sacrifice, and G5 was probably dubious. Why do I have a London emote? London's my favorite opening. And it's one of my favorite cities, too. <laughs> the 
the chat knows the chat knows very well Ah, there was a question earlier. What's your fave opening? Yeah, a lot of these questions I feel like have been answered accidentally. So I could take, take, take. Wait, so takes, 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 rook b1. I'm down a piece. And if knight f6 exists, and I'm down a piece. I could do this, but then I'll be down two pieces. So now I have to fight back from probably what's going to be a bad position. I'm looking for counterplay. Yeah, I think I'll go and just take the stuff, play queen f6. Yeah, g5 was overly careless. I think white should have played queen f3 first. Because now queen f6, I defend and I'm preventing queen f3. And I have some pawns. I haven't lost a single pawn. And my e pawn is now a b pawn. So we're going to see some more pawn play this game. I hope uh, you got Jess is still watching. Because I, I have to make use of my pawns. Like I have, how many pawns am I up? I can't count. White's missing two pawns. So I'm up, uh, I'm up two pawns. I think I'll castle queenside. Oh, that's a dangerous move though. So he wants to take also wants to play e5. d4 is very strong. Don't really want to castle kingside. Oh, this is tough. Okay. Losing a pawn back. I'll have one pawn for a bishop. I could very well lose this game. Hey, it's more bits. <laughs> pawn play. Yeah, my rooks are sad, but at least they're connected. Okay, so now another pawn's attacked. Yeah, where's my pawn play? I'm gonna sack another pawn. Sometimes pawns are just getting in the way of open files. So what I wanna do here, I wanna open the A file so my rook can come to A3 and then eventually F3 or H3. And then the eventual goal is to mate Let's play c5. More pawn play. That's what we call pawn tension. Pawns are, st oh, there's so much pawn tension. Oh, it's so confusing. I have to take, I think. I can choose which pawn to take. I'll put the queen on f4. I mean, I just want to play c4 and kill white's extra piece. I think this rook on b2 is not looking so great. That's a good move though. Okay, let's put the rook here. Actually, I don't know if bishop d5 was good because now it's a little bit stuck. Queen f3, okay. A 
I don't think queen f3 is... I mean, queen f3 looks like it's almost saving light, but I have this move now. And... I think I'm winning back a piece. It's a miracle. Uh, yeah, my opponent is clearly not cheating. And uh, just a disclaimer, I don't really support people, or I, I don't really recommend people saying or accusing someone of cheating without sufficient evidence. Um, yeah. And Baby Onion, I mean, has been a, a viewer for a long time. Um, trusted viewer, too. He is playing some good moves, though. But the momentum is shifting. Okay, let's take a bishop. If I take with the rook, there's rook d1, which is really troublesome. So I have to take with the queen. And we'll probably have some rook ending. Yeah, my pawn advantage kind of disappeared. But at least white's bishop disappeared. This pawn is weak. So the pawn count is equal. I was talking about some overextended pawns earlier. It's e5 pawn, very overextended. My g5 pawn prevents white from playing f4. So I'll go up a pawn. I think I want to play h6 first. There's no rush to take. There's some lines where white playing h6 would be annoying. Yeah, I see the question about must know openings. Um, but I like the answer from Yago. It, it does depend on like what your repertoire is. Because I mean, I, I would say there's there's not really a must know opening in chess because there's so many options, so many playable options for uh, both sides. And sometimes it depends what the opponent is playing too. I mean, for pure beginners, must know opening is how to not get scholars mated. Okay, I think this is a winning king pawn ending. Thankfully, there's increments. This is also casual, too, so no rating on the line. Yeah, um, my opponent played well. Like, he... Uh, Definitely capitalized on this g5 move. <laughs> um, h3, g4 was uh, was played at the right time. But then, okay, in blitz chess, there's always going to be these kind of blunder type moments. And all it takes is one oversight. Like bishop d5 already, it's uh, a little bit tricky for white. I was thinking in this position, maybe bishop e4. Queen takes b2 and then queen f5. Actually, bishop e4 might save white. Because I don't think I can allow this. Unless I have rook e8. 
it gets complicated pretty quickly. I probably wouldn't want to go into this. The bishop e4 would have been interesting. I feel bad I didn't play the two knights. Like he he wanted me to play some specific opening. Well, I I would play one more game where because I'm curious what he wants to play against me. <laughs> but other people are challenging me too. Ah, uh, we have a question saying, "May I ask you some questions?" <laughs> Uh, yes, you, you may. Um, okay, so six pounder. You're a moderate 2,000 rated player who would be happy to jump to 2,300. Notice one of my weak points is still the opening. Tips on ta how to effectively learn openings. I've been talking a lot about this, this stream, like learning openings using like some opening database combined with Stockfish. Um, I've talked about this in the past too, about like building a repertoire. Uh, either using Lee Chess or Chess Base. Um, but one video which maybe would help, which I can link to, let me go back to my Q&A study, Twitch chat, <laughs> I keep losing the study. Um, tips for learning openings. I've been covering a lot of random stuff, so if anyone wants to like, go and look over what I've been covering, I'm leaving the study link in the chat again. Um, for this chapter, I'm, I'll just link one of my recent YouTube videos. Mm. Hopefully it pops up. Yeah, it's called Building an Opening Repertory Using WeChess.org. In that video, I give tips on like how to save things and stay organized. So hopefully that will be of some use. But yeah, at a higher level, it can be a bit different. Like if you're already above 2000, um, Sometimes it's about committing to one line and staying consistent and not spreading yourself too thin. If you're playing a bunch of different things and sometimes it's, it's hard to learn one thing really well. So I'd recommend maybe spending some time choosing what to pursue and then staying persistent and playing a lot of games and continually expanding on, uh, especially on, on the lines that you run into often. So every game you should expand maybe a little bit in your opening repertoire. Um, okay, somehow this link didn't... Oh, Google is being weird with links. Let me actually paste in the, the video. Oh, it does... So, I don't know why it does that. What is this? Really struggling with links. Okay. I just wanted to embed normally. There we go. Okay. Am I subscribed to PewDiePie? I don't know. I don't really want to check. I was watching one of his videos earlier, though. Like he was giving tips for YouTubers. It's an interesting video. Um, I know there, there were a ton of questions I missed earlier. Can I play Alucard as black? As black? So now people are just asking me to play stuff. Okay, we'll play someone. Let's 
let's play this guy in the middle. I'll pre-move knight f6. If he plays e4, your wish will come true. Hey, it's bits. Do I play the black mardimer gambit? Almost never. But a gambit I do play is a Budapest gambit. What time control would I recommend for a novice player trying to improve? You're 1500 but haven't ventured. Oh, you're 1500 in blitz. Um, play at least like 15 minutes. Then you have time to like think, at least during critical moments. Because blitz, you really have to rely on intuition and a lot of games come down to time scrambles. So 15 minutes, I think, is a nice, nice spot to do consistently. Or 15 plus 15. Whatever games you can start like easily from the home page. Okay, so we have um, one of the mainline Budapest variations. It's important to note bishop c5 provokes e3, so this bishop gets stuck. Uh, now I'll win the pawn. I showed this in a YouTube video, I think earlier this month, the very beginning of the month, where the middle game plan for black, actually I won't say it because it's, it's about to happen. Usually black just castles. And it's important to avoid playing d6 too early, as we'll see. Start with rook e8. Do I upload the stream to YouTube? I'm behind with YouTube uploads because it takes effort to export and edit and then like export again and then upload and do all the description stuff. I need to hire someone to do that for me. Um, I'll, maybe I'll probably put this on YouTube. Maybe I'll just put it as like a just its own stream and not do any editing. We'll see. How do I change Nightbot where people can share certain types of links? If someone's linking a leech S study, I'd want I'd want it to stay. I'm sorry for Nightbot being overly powerful. Uh, 94 is a good move. It's one of the reasons I play rook e8 is to uh, allow bishop f8. Oh, Lee chess links are allowed, okay. Huh. Yeah, I think there, there's only a few people that have control over my night bot. <laughs> okay, so the, the middle game plan for black is rook h6 and checkmate. Queen d4, I mean, queen d4 creates this battery, but the bishop defends g7. So I'll go for this. I'm not afraid my rook will be trapped. Like, white would have c5 to attack the rook, but it's hard to attack the rook on h6. And it's only after the rook swings over that next I want to play d6 and get my bishop into play and soon get my queen into play. It's a fun plan. So queen h4 could be played immediately. Let's do it. I'm aligning the queen with the knight. There might be ideas of... There's actually two threats with queen h4. I mean, the obvious threat this. But then another threat, which I don't think white stopped, which is this, attacking the knight and attacking the queen. So I think black is winning a piece. 
always play bishop f8. A bis the bishop on f8 is so clutch. Allowed the knight not to be pinned, and now, now things are being attacked left and right. Yeah, I apologize to people whose questions I did not answer, um, especially earlier. I, it's hard to give thorough answers and answer everything. <laughs> okay, let's take the knight with the queen. And I'll probably shift the rook over to g6 and target g2. Unless white plays bishop f3, and then I, then I have to deal with it. I, mean, I would love to play bishop b4 soon, but then I get mated. So if I have the time, I'll play rook g6, threatening mate. Ah, he plays bishop f3. I mean, it's okay, I'm up a piece. This is not a position to overthink. Let's put the queen back. Super safe. And then I'll go for this. And then this, and then this, maybe. Or maybe this, I don't know. I'm self-taught, but I don't think NN is a real target for me, yada yada. Um... Yeah, if you have some goal of like attaining some title or some rating, it's okay to have a goal like that, but you also want to have just more you want to have like some like study goals where instead of aiming for a specific rating, you're aiming for like solving a certain number of puzzles every day or or playing a certain number of training games or a certain number of tournament games every so often. Because those are very, like, much more attainable, easier to accomplish, and that, that will help you get to your eventual rating goals or title goals. Okay, let's play this. Was 17 queen g6 better? Maybe. 17, queen, g6. But I want my rook on g6. I mean, I, I would be threatening this, but white could move the king. Okay, so we're trading. Oh, bishop takes c6 makes me very happy. Because now there's... I mean, <laughs> the only white piece on the king side is white's king. And I have most of my pieces aimed at the king side. Laying in bed, eating ramen, and watching Eric. What's better? I mean, pod thai is way better than ramen. Like, way better. This is a free pawn. What's my opinion about Philidor for black? Oh, Philidor Black Lion opening. I know very little about it. I've been asked it asked about it many times before, but um, I think objectively at like high levels, it's just kind of passive for Black. But maybe it's playable. H six G five is something I I don't know like off the top of my head. Bishop e4, important to discover check, block the rook, and queen h4 is mate next move. How is elo compared to blitz rating? Um, it varies from player to player. Some players are better at blitz. Some players are much worse at blitz compared to their, their classical rating. Uh, you have started to play two months ago. You haven't played anything besides blitz. And bullet you only play online yeah I will say like online play is a lot different than like classical over the board play 
Um, I've I've had like a good number of students who play exclusively online and don't play in tournaments, and then it's interesting to see like when they play in an over the board tournament how they do. And one student comes to mind that he was like nineteen hundred in online blitz. And I think over the board. I want to say he's like fourteen or fifteen hundred U.S. rated, so maybe about like fifteen, sixteen hundred in in uh, FIDE. I could have won the exchange. Oh, I could have taken the rook on G two. There were more important things in life. You have a box of pod Thai in your pantry. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have a box, you should make it. But does, is, is Pod Thai supposed to come in a box? That sounds wrong. It should come, I mean, it should come from a Thai restaurant. That's usually the best place. Or in, in the form of like street food, but I mean, it's better than nothing. You're a purely online player, but what ELO do you think 1900 rapid player would have? Uh, probably 1500, 15 to 1600, I'd say, like ballpark. But I don't know. I mean, it. It could fluctuate again for player, for different types of players. Um, but I will say I don't think nineteen hundred online would be nineteen hundred fide. I think there's at least a a three to four hundred point drop. But then for me, I guess like my I don't know my Lee chess ratings kind of correspond with my fide ratings. Let's see. Yeah, my ultra bullet rating corresponds pretty well within 20 to 30 points and my blitz and my rapid wait what's my feeder rating because i took a hit like my recent tournaments ah, i lost points i'm 23 38 um Yeah, so my my blitz and rapid are, are pretty close to FIDE. <sighs> When's the next viewer tournament? Right now? No, just kidding. Um, I don't know. I need to schedule one. I could do a poll. Do like a Google form. Maybe tomorrow? Do I have anything planned for tomorrow? I think I'll do one tomorrow. Viewer tournament. We'll do one around this time. Hopefully most people will be happy with that. Um, for those watching, maybe those who aren't watching right now won't be happy with that. Uh, viewer tournament. I typed in viewer and it auto-corrected to viruses. It's not a good omen. Uh, let me change this to my chess calendar. What's a preferred time control? Do people prefer... I mean, I've been... I, so I did one viewer tournament with 5 plus 0. I did another one with 7 plus 0. I could also do 3-2. I could do 10-0. I think anything longer would be a bit too much. Dot org. I'm curious now if it updated like automatically. If I just go to my website, it's not loading. Ah, there it is. So I do have a schedule. I didn't update. Usually when I add an event, it takes like one to two hours to appear. It's Google Calendar, slow it's syncing. 
Um, so people want, oh man, it's a good variety of things. 5 plus 3, 5 plus 3, 5 plus 3, 5 plus 0, 10 plus 0. So 10 plus 0 is, is good for commentary, but then it just encourages berserking. I could turn off berserking for the tournament. I could, I could create the tournament right now. Yeah, let's create the tournament. Play... Uh, tournament? Yeah, and I mean, this applies to anyone who... Like, if, if you ever want to create your own tournament, you can. This is a great feature on Lee Chess. Anyone can do this. You don't have to have any special privileges. Um, yeah, I have to remember all the settings, though. So 10, okay, it looks like most people want 10 plus 0, so I will make this 10 plus 0. And to make it fair for everyone, in terms of tournament uh, points, I'm going to restrict berserking. Because mostly chess tournaments, people will berserk, but no berserking. So no adding of points. I hope that doesn't cause some uh, some issues. I guess I can make it casual too. Do people want casual or rated? Three plus, okay. So I guess I'm going no increment. Rated, casual, oh man. <laughs> this is not a good system to just rely on the chat. Don't care. Rated, rated, rated. I think rated slightly wins. What are the subs saying? I'm only going to look at sub responses. Rated, rated, casual. <laughs> we are a fickle bunch. <laughs> I could flip a coin. I have a coin in my pocket. OK. Heads or tails. <laughs> if I say heads or tails, there's going to be so many comments like heads and tails. Oh, this is pretty simple. Okay, so this is a tie coin. This is 10 bot. This is a head. And this is a tail. Wait. Okay. You ready? Um, now I'm going to show this. I'm not touching the coin. Wait, I didn't even call the... <laughs> so it is... It is heads, but what does that mean? I don't know. What does heads mean? I guess heads means casual, right? Does heads mean rated? Wait, let's do this again. Okay, so head, heads is casual. One more time. Heads, casual. Oh, it's tails. I'm not lying. Uh, so it's going to be rated. Uh, I don't even see the rating setting. Oh, duration. Uh, duration should be maybe two hours. Right? Two hours? I can make it like, I can make it six hours. Let's make it two hours. <laughs> I'm str struggling with minutes converted to hours here. Two hours, yeah, I think that's fine. Um, no password. 
Oh yeah, so this is rated, okay. Um, then the hardest part is a custom start date. I was struggling with this earlier. Whoa, let's get, I don't know where that came from. Was that there the whole time? Hmm. Um, it's supposed to pop up, but it's not popping up. I might have to go to Chrome. I have to like, um, we just want 11 p.m. Or no, we want 9 p.m. Create new tournament. Yeah, so it, it gave me invalid timestamp. Ah, now I get it, okay. I had this bug earlier too, where like it wasn't showing up, but now, what's today? Today's Tuesday? Wait, so Thailand time. Oh, so tomorrow is Tuesday. What is this? Me chess, you're supposed to be good with not having bugs. Nan, what's Nan? I know it's Monday for some people, but oh, tomorrow's Tuesday for me. I have to start over because it's being annoying. <laughs> I'm really struggling here. Oh, it saved everything though. That's nice. And settings. Undefined. Cancel. Are there any like Lee Chess mods or admins in the chat? Can help me. I just wanna Oh there we go. Okay, it's working. So Tuesday. Uh I assume this is local time for me, so we'll do nine PM Thailand time. Oh, that's a nice interface. Beautiful. Um now I have to change the time control. Ten minutes rated. No berserking and create. What? Oh, I forgot to change this, so two hours. That's a nice feature. Nice nice job, Lee Chess, for not allowing me to create a bogus tournament like that. Did the clock time save? It did, nice. Okay, create new tournaments. Nine PM. Beautiful. If people want to join, I'm leaving the link here. I turned Berserking off. That was my decision. Because you guys made enough decisions for me. Um, I will also share the link in my calendar when I when I'm able to copy paste it. Okay, I think uh, that's enough work for now. Um, Pass Pond ninety nine. I'm still in Thailand, heading to Portugal in a few days. One side note, though, when when people click the link to go to the tournament, uh, the tournament link, uh, the time zone or the time should update to whatever their local time is. So most people should see a different time than nine p.m. <laughs> Why is it starting in twenty one hours? Because I say so. Okay, I think I'm ending it there. Uh, Passpaw99, offering to mod, sure, I'll mod Passpaw99, doesn't hurt. With great mods comes great responsibility. Um, yeah, I'm not going to Singapore, at least soon, 
I was I flew through Singapore not too long ago. I was there a few times last year. I'll probably be back at some point. Okay, so I'm ending it there. Um, one last thing. Ah, yeah. I have a very, very, very important announcement. Oh, and Patrick JMT just got here. It's very bad timing. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that